Hey everyone, in this video, I wanted to explore the Windows Auto Patch service, something really designed to take away a lot of the stress and the overhead of patching our Windows environment. As always, if this is useful, a like and subscribe is appreciated. Now, if we think about our environments, we patch for many different reasons. There are the obvious reasons where we just think about, hey, health. There are overall bugs found in software. There are challenges, there are performance optimizations. So for the overall health of our device, we patch to make things better. We also patch for security reasons. Hey, there is some vulnerability, there's some new CVE. So we patch to resolve that, to remove that possible exposure. When we think about security, patching is a huge part of that. Many times companies are attacked and vulnerabilities are exposed and utilized that have already been patched. It's simply that organization has not rolled out that patch to their environment yet. So, hey, the fix is there, but maybe because of a process, because of time, they've not rolled it out in a timely manner so people exploit it. So it's really important as part of our security posture to get patches rolled out in a very timely manner. But they can also be related to functionality. If we think, for example, about Windows Client, yes, we have the idea of quality updates, Patch Tuesday, etc. Then you get the feature updates, which deliver ongoing new units of functionality. So if I think about, hey, that idea of patching, absolutely, we have the operating system. And as I really just kind of mentioned, there's that idea of quality updates, that Patch Tuesday, and maybe in between, if there is some zero day, and that's something to consider as well, hey, that's gonna get released kind of out of the regular band. We wanna get that deployed as quickly as possible. Then obviously there are those feature updates. So I can think about different things associated with the operating system. But then there are key applications on top of that. I might think, for example, about Edge. Edge has its own update mechanisms. We might be using Office. So we have the Microsoft 365 applications. And then as part of that, we have Teams. And this is the focus today when we think about Windows Auto Patch. Now you may say, hey look, Windows has the button I can click and auto update, I'm good. That's generally not an acceptable answer for organizations. If I think about an organization, I think about, hey, these patches and actually deploying them out to my organization, well, there is a chance a patch could actually introduce a problem. Sometimes we have a driver, you have an application that's using maybe some undocumented API. Well, that undocumented API maybe gets closed or modified as part of some update. So we don't really like to just, hey, every machine in our 10,000 machine company or 100,000 or 10, it's really all levels. I don't wanna just roll that out to everyone all in one go. What I really want is to get some confidence starting off small and get gradually bigger sets of the population to increase my confidence as I roll it out to more and more of the organization. And the way we do that is for our deployments, we like to use the idea of rings. And what's very, very typical is I'll have a very, very small part of the population for testing, then maybe a larger part of the population where I have some hero users, where I have people from each line of business group to test each line of business application, then a bigger group so I can get even more confidence across a wider range of devices and applications. And then we think about the, the broader rollout to everything. And as all of this is happening, I can think that my confidence is growing. I'm getting more confidence as I roll it out to incrementally larger populations. Hey, I'm not seeing a problem, things are looking good. I feel comfortable with going to that next ring for more and more machines. But to facilitate this type of thing, well, I need solutions. I need solutions around tooling. 
how I'm managing those rings? How am I putting machines into those rings? As new machines are onboarded, well, which ring do they go in? Uh, how do I take them out? How do I monitor what's happening? If I see a problem, how do I know there's a problem? How do I react quick enough? And so that really then bleeds into the idea of there's a whole bunch of IT admin work, headache and stress related to patching. And I do have to think about, hey, how do I handle a zero day? What do I do if there is some hideous new vulnerability found? Hey, the patch is released. How do I get it out as quickly as possible? And as you would expect, or this would be a pretty depressing um, talk, the answer here is Windows Auto Patch. And the key thing I feel about Windows Auto Patch is right now, I think times are challenging. Uh, financially, companies are struggling. There's a huge focus on doing more with less. And I think Windows Auto Patch has really been introduced as a key part of that. It's not something new I have to buy. It's simply new functionality that is lit up based on my existing licenses. Now there are functionalities this leverages, so I have to own those. This isn't saying new I have to buy. If I own the prerequisites, I can now just start taking advantages of this. So the whole point is take the stress away from patching from the IT administrators, let them go and focus on other things that may be more um, useful, that are gonna light up more business productivity for the organization. So how does this work? So the whole point around this is I think about, I as an organization, I have my Azure AD tenant. And it's already based around starting at the Azure AD tenant. So I have my Azure AD instance for my company. Now the key point here is the users have to be populated in here. My devices are registered, joined, one of those two things, to my Azure AD. So I have them in there. Now, in terms of what are the requirements to use this today, what I require is Windows E3 or above, so it could be E5. There are many different SKUs that include those, but I have to have Windows E3 or above. The devices have to be managed by Intune. So I need Intune because it's really that that's gonna drive a lot of the functionality that Windows Auto Patch requires. And it also talks about Azure AD Premium, so P1 or above. I think that's a lot around the code management scenarios, but it does still list that as Azure AD Premium. It needs to be lit up on the tenant, so I have to have Azure AD Premium on the tenant. So if I have Windows E3, if I have Intune and Azure AD Premium on my tenant, well, now I have to be a global admin, I can enroll. So my first step is to actually go through and say, I want to enroll in Windows Auto Patch. And it's a very, very simple process. I'm actually gonna go over to here. And I'm borrowing someone else's tenant because they have some nice devices. They were kind enough to lend this to me. So what I would actually be able to do is in the Microsoft Endpoint Manager admin center, so endpoint.microsoft.com, I would go to tenant administration. So you can see we have this tenant administration option down here. That is already onboarded, but what I'd see providing I'm meeting the requirements for this, I'll see Windows Auto Patch. And I'd go and select the Windows Auto Patch and it will give me the enroll option. Now, as part of that, it's gonna go and check a number of things. So it's gonna go and check, hey, I, I meet those requirements. It's gonna ask me for a few pieces of information. It's gonna ask me for some contact details. And then once it's gone through that, it will then go and complete the enrollment of my tenant into Windows Auto Patch. And it's gonna do a number of things as part of that enrollment. The first thing it's gonna do is it's gonna create some groups. Now, I'm enrolling my tenant. So you might think, well, does that mean it has to manage every single device? No, 
I have control over which devices I want to enroll in the auto patch. And the way it's gonna do that is it creates a group. It creates a group called Windows Auto Patch Device Registration. So until a machine is placed into that group, it's not gonna be managed by the Windows Auto Patch service. Now I can add devices into this group a number of ways. I can obviously just manually. I could manually add devices into it. If I'm using Windows 365, so the cloud PC, as part of the provisioning process that I can actually create with Windows 365 and create provisioning policies, you'll actually see there's now an option for extra services and one of those is auto patch. So if I check that as part of the provisioning policy as it creates my cloud PC, it can then go and enroll it in auto patch to, to keep it current. I also can nest groups inside here. So I could add groups. Now it might be I have an existing group, I've maybe manually added machine or I have dynamic rules that are the PCs that I happen to want. I might add multiple groups. It might be I create a new dynamic group and nest it in here that maybe just all devices get added to. So the key part is I can add groups so I can nest and I can absolutely take advantage of things like dynamic groups so that as new devices get onboarded into my Azure AD, well, they then automatically get added to the dynamic group, which I've nested inside the Windows Auto Patch device registration. So I don't have to do anything. Hey, devices get known to my Azure AD, they get added to the group, they get added into this device registration. So at this point, they now become known and managed by the Auto Patch. Now, there is another step that has to happen. It will actually go and check them. If we were to go and look, over here for a second. Well, firstly, we can see the group. So if I just go and look at groups for a second, and I scroll down to the bottom, absolutely, you'll see that Windows Auto Patch Device Registration Group. So the machines in there will then get managed as part of the Windows Auto Patch. But there is another step. If I go and look at devices, and then we'll see there's a Windows Auto Patch section where I can select my devices again. It does then go and do a check. So it's gonna go and pause that group periodically, every, I think every few hours, or you notice I can go and hit a discover devices to accelerate that along. But it will then go and check the PCs in that group. And it's gonna go and check if they meet the prerequisites. So when I think about prerequisites, is it managed by Intune? Has to be managed by Intune. Is it not already managed by AutoPatch? Is it Windows 10 or Windows 11? Is it Pro or Enterprise? So it has to be one of those SKUs. If I am using co-management, so I have Configuration Manager as well, well, I have to have some of the key workloads managed by Intune. If I think about Windows Update Policies, Device Configuration, Office Click to Run, those have to be the responsibility of Intune. So it's gonna go and check all of those things. Assuming that is they pass all the prereqs, then we can see they're sitting nicely in here and they're sitting in the ready tab. It also has a not ready tab. So if for some reason there was a problem, it will go and sit in that not ready. I'll get some ideas of why and I could maybe go and take some actions around that. But for right now, we'll focus on the ready. Notice it shows us the model. So I can see, hey, these are VMs, but I could also see, for example, information from the OEM. I would see if it's a cloud PC from Windows 365. So I get some great information. Okay, but now what? Let's think back to the workloads this supports. And we'll start off with the idea of the operating system. So I can think that Okay, we'll, we'll go, go orange. So we have the OS. So we have our operating system. And once again, if I think about the operating system, it is Windows 10 or 11 
pro or enterprise. And if we think back to what we saw, remember there are different types of updates. So we want handled very, very differently. Obviously we have the whole patch Tuesday, so I have quality. These we want rolled out using rings ideally, so we get confidence, but I wanna be pretty quick. I wanna get these available and rolled out to my organization, maybe within a couple of weeks. We also have the idea of feature. Now remember for feature, they're a lot less frequent, but they add functionality. They may change the user experience. So I probably want an even bigger gap between the different stages between my rings so that I get more time to see the user behavior. If it's any kind of change, maybe there's calls to my help desk, not because there's a problem, just because something's moved, so I'm getting calls to my help desk. So I might wanna stagger these out even more to get more confidence, to give users more time so they can make those calls to the help desk so we don't overload them, and then they can go and help other people. So I think about, hey, then there's the feature, and then obviously we do have those zero day, and just to really emphasize this, we'll do that in a different color. Zero day, some critical exposure that, hey, has been shown out in the wild or it's been discovered and not really used yet, but we wanna get this out as quickly as possible. So for all of these things, when I think about this quality and feature, I wanna use rings. I wanna have this idea of getting that confidence, ever increasing percentages of my device population. And Windows Auto Patch uses four rings. So it has a ring called Test. It has a ring called First. It has a ring called Fast. And then it has a ring Broad. And if we think about the idea of ever increasing percents of our population, there is no one added by default to test. We're gonna come back to that. But the target percentage for first is 1%. The target population for fast is 9%. The target population for broad, when well, we can do math, is 90%. And these are actually groups created in your Azure AD. So if we go and look at our groups for a second, back over here, now I don't have to mess with these at all, but we will see these modern workspace devices, Windows Auto Patch. You can see there's the, the there's three and there's the other one. And those have those names. So it's that whole, if we make that a little bit bigger, we can see, hey, yeah. Okay, test, first, fast, and broad. So it's creating groups to represent each of those. But we're also gonna see them when I go to that auto patch devices and we just see the group. Now, what's happened here is they're all test fast or first because obviously they're, they're testing, they're playing around, they've moved the devices around. So they've moved them all out of broad. And that is actually part of the point of this. So what's happening is they are automatically balanced when they are brought in. And what I mean by that is as the devices are brought in and as they're added to the Windows Auto Patch device registration, when they pass the prereqs, at that point, that balancing is applied. So it will automatically take them and from this group also add them to first, fast, and broad. And the way it's gonna add them is it's gonna try and keep these ratios, 1%, 9%, 90%. So it's gonna spread them out over those. But I can also manually move machines. It is not really using any advanced machine learning at this point. It's not looking at which line of business apps are installed on different machines what vendor or OEM is for this type of hardware to try and get those distributions. It really is just trying to, hey, 1%, 9%, 90%. 90%. So I, as the administrator initially, I am absolutely gonna want to go and move some machines. For example, if I have some IT administration test machines, 
well, I'm gonna go and move some machines, for example, into test so that I really monitor those machines closely from whatever ring it happened to be in. I'm also likely to go and put some machines into first. Remember, I want a sampling, maybe from all the key line of business applications, those hero users, so they're gonna go and, and see those. Likewise, they have so I'm gonna move out, I wanna put it into broad. My CEO, my CFO, I don't want them in first. So there's gonna be some massaging initially. When I move them manually, it does not do a rebalancing. So the way it will then get back to these percentages is as new device adds, it will try and, it will add them to whichever group is furthest away from its target percentage. So if this only had sort of 7%, but these were kind of close to 90 and one, it's gonna put some in fast. So I can absolutely manually move machines around. And we can see that right here. And this is what obviously has been happened in this environment, which is why there's no broad. But I can go and select machines, and I can say device actions, assign device group. So if I had my CFO and my CEO machine, for example, I could assign device group, and I could say, I wanna put them in broad. And then I would hit save. So I can absolutely move them. And likewise, if it was some IT test machines, hey, I wanna put them in test. So I can go and move things around as I need to. Also notice, you do have the register. So if there were some machines I actually wanna take out, of the control of auto patch. It's super easy. Select them and select the register. It's not destructive. It's not removing it from Azure AD or Intune's management or anything like that. It's just going to remove it from the auto patch um, sphere of control. So definitely I think initially you're gonna go and do a, a little bit of movement around those. If I also went and looked at policies, for example, you'll see the four rings here as well. You'll see, if I could actually get this, I can't get it, but you can see those four rings are here. And you'll also notice this quality deferral. So this is test, zero, this will be first, one, fast, six, and broad, nine. So what is, what is this all about? What is this deferral thing? Well, it comes back to those idea of, well, what's the whole point of rings? The whole point of rings is, as there are updates, let's say quality initially, I don't want them to hit all of the machines at once. I want them to hit a certain population, then after a period of time, the next, period of time, the next, etc. And so you have this idea, so we start with quality, of well, how is it making those available? And so what it's gonna do, for the test ring, they're available straight away. There's zero deferral um, for those. For first, there is a one day deferral and also I have a two day deadline. So what happens is the user experience, they'll start getting those notifications, nag messages, but they can push it off for up to two days. So it's gonna wait a day, then make it available to the users and they'll have two days to defer. Now, after that two days, it's then gonna go into enforcement mode. It will force them to install. It will start ignoring um, those active hours and just make them do the reboot. For fast, it's six plus two. And for broad, it's nine plus five. And these are all documented. So if we go and look at the documentation for a second, over here, we can see exactly this. So it's showing me here, standard release, test group, there's no deferral. First group, there's one day deferral and then two days deadline. Fast is six and two, broad is nine and five. And notice you have this idea of a grace period. The grace period is focused around the idea that imagine I'm on vacation and my machine was just turned off and both the deferral and deadline have passed. I turn my machine on, it's gonna give me a grace period. So it doesn't make me reboot instantly, it's gonna add that grace period. So in this case, for example, two days, I would have if my machine hasn't been running, but hey, I can now go back and go and use that. So we have those options available to us. But do notice, expedited is zero. 
it is not using the rings at all. So when we think about this idea of a zero day, the whole point of this is now. And it's basically plus one, but it's now. It's not using the rings, it's expedited, and this is Microsoft make this decision, they push this down. It's not using the rings. It's just gonna get that out as quickly as possible, which is what you want. This is a zero day. This is an important thing. I want this pushed out to my environment as quickly as possible. Again, normally it's gonna restart outside of active hours, but if they go past these times it's been given, they just keep ignoring it, then it is gonna enforce it, it's gonna just make them do it. And so then likewise on the feature side, remember we want that over a much longer period of time. So what the feature is gonna do is test it zero and then you have five days. For first it's 30 plus five, 60 plus five, and then 90. So these are the times it's gonna wait before it's even made available to the ring, then they have five days to click it. And the reason for this is, well, you want them to get it installed, you don't wanna give them 30 days to delay it, because I wanna see them actually using it and see it get tested and see the user impacts and all of those things. So yes, they have basically a week after it's made available to them, then you get a, a, probably 25 days to sit and watch each of these groups and the behavior of it. So once again, this is why it's so important to especially in test and first, make sure I'm getting the right populations. Definitely in first, I want some line of business hero users from all the groups. So I make sure those line of business apps really are getting tested in, hey, quality updates, hey, the feature updates. I want that to be very, very visible to me. Now, one of the huge things that is happening here, and one of the other benefits of auto patch is yes, auto patch is orchestrating this for me, but realize when you patch, there are sometimes problems. There are problems that with certain drivers, there are problems with certain applications. And what's gonna happen here, data signals from all tenants. I wouldn't say it's telemetry as such because it's not client, they can't tell which customer, but there are signals sent back so they can see, oh look, this is, this is causing a problem. We're seeing a problem with this update, with this patch. And so they can then actually make the decision to pause future deployments. They can even do things like roll back. And again, it's not just in your tenant, they can see it across all of the tenants. So a huge benefit I'm getting here is yes, the orchestration of this, but also the ability of, hey, this service is seeing the progress across every customer. And if it starts to detect there's a problem, it can halt it, maybe even roll it back, they can then, they will go and work with the Windows team to see that what needs to get done. Maybe it's even a reissue, whatever that might be. But that's part of this service. That intelligence they're getting, you get the benefit of. So don't think of it as, oh, it's just pushing them out. It's monitoring them across all the tenants and reacting for you if there is some hint of problem. They are pulled from the internet. So it's not using its own distribution system. So it's pulling them from the internet. That does mean if you're using things like Windows delivery optimization, it will still take advantage of that. So if I'm thinking about network optimization, definitely still look at things like, hey, do I want to be able to share between peers, um, features such as that. And then the obvious question comes, so, okay, so what's the difference between this and Windows Update for Business? Once again, I think, here you have a much better handling of that dynamic nature of devices being added and removed. It's got much better incident response. If there is some problem with a certain drive or with a certain application, it helps remove your brain cycles that I have to do related to patching. There's a lot less administration, it's handling the rings for you. So I think it, it takes what Windows Update for Business does and just adds a whole bunch more to it. And then obviously we go beyond that operating system, then you really can think about things such as um, Edge. So if I think about Edge, for example, now obviously Edge does its own thing. They have their own cycle. I think Edge checks every 10 hours for updates. I think it has quality updates weekly, uh, feature updates, whatever that is, some other time period. And it automatically does its own 
progressive. It doesn't just release it to everyone. So Edge just on its own does its own thing. So Auto Patch is not adding something of its own here. It's just letting it do its thing. The only thing that is done here is the test ring. So if I think about the sort of dashed dotted line going on here, the test ring will actually use the beta channel. Whereas the rest of the rings, first, fast, and broad, well, they will use the stable. So there is one change there, but apart from that, it is not using the rings. It is using Edge's own set of mechanisms to do progressive rollouts. Um, Edge, as you know, downloads the bits in the background. Then you'll see that little upgrade arrow. It goes green, then yellow, then red. Hey, please, please restart Edge. So you just restart Edge. It keeps where you were in all the tabs. And then, hey, you've got that update. We obviously have the Microsoft 365 apps. And once again, Microsoft 365 apps. Now what you're gonna get here is the monthly enterprise channel. But once again, it has its own CDN. It has an office content delivery network and it uses that to do a progressive download and um, release. So it doesn't just make Office updates available to everyone at the same time. It also will make different portions of the population aware that, hey, there's a new update to Office. So Auto Patch is not using its rings here. Office has its own CDN-based progressive um, release. So that will just still be used. So again, you're gonna use that monthly uh, enterprise channel. And then finally, Teams. And as you're gonna guess, it also has its own. So this also doesn't use rings. It just has its own mechanism. I think it's once a month for all of the users. There can be the technology adopter program that gets twice a month. But basically, I think it's typically a Monday. They might do critical updates in between, but they again have their own update mechanisms to actually go and roll this out. And that's it. So there's not like a huge demo because the whole point of this is it just works. I enroll my tenant, I pick the devices I want to be part of this. And once you're confident with this, you probably will have some kind of nested group that is a dynamic group so just automatically adds machines in. You are gonna do that initial management of getting some machines in test, getting some good sampling in first and obviously fast as well, making sure you don't have your CEO and the CFO in any of those and put them in broad. So there's gonna be, be some manual manipulation at first just to get some key machines, but then it's gonna take care of putting the machines to keep to this 1%, 9%, 90% as best it can and control those really rollouts for you. I can monitor today, I can see the status of the quality updates. So if I was to go, oh, that was the wrong tab. Let me go and look at the other tab. There we go. If I was to go and look at um, reports, what we have today is Windows Auto Patch Windows quality updates. So if we go over here, I can see these quality updates. I think more will come over time, but then we can go and get some really nice detail over exactly where we are. I can go and get detailed reports but I can see exactly where we are within the various rings and what we're doing uh, with regard to that patching. So that's, that's a key thing we have. And I think another key thing to emphasize today is this is really about helping the IT teams. It really is that whole message of, hey, do more with less. Giving the IT teams a bit of step back from the stress and the burden of the patching so I can focus on other things. This is a starting point. As you probably see with many Microsoft services, you have this V1 that focuses very much on the absolute core functionality that it must have. I wouldn't even say minimal viable product because this, this has some fantastic functionality, but this is a starting point. I think we're gonna see a lot of enhancements coming to this and the PG have been very vocal about, hey, we're just gonna keep building and building on this. It is a great fit for customers today. 
I think there's a huge range of large and small that this is just gonna be a great fit for right now. If I'm a more complex customer, maybe some of the frontline worker scenarios or the GCC scenarios, if I'm a more complex, this may not be right today. But I think they're gonna build and, and keep adding to this. But definitely I think it's worth looking at, it's worth evaluating. For most customers, this could just, hey, take a whole set of stress and burden off me right now. So I hope that was useful. I hope it kind of gave some idea of what this is all about and that the benefits this brings. Um, and as always, till next video, take care.